welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the vestibular system. Okay, so we're currently in the process of discussing the otolith organs, the utricle and the saccule, and we are trying to understand what sort of sensory information the utricle and the saccule are actually going to encode. And what we've seen so far is that the sensory apparatuses of the utricle and the saccule are in the form of these maculae, these portions of the membranes of the utricle and the saccule. And in the case of the saccule, we've seen that the macula is in the medial wall of the saccule. And in the case of the utricle, we've seen that it's in the inferior wall of the utricle. Okay, so what we now want to turn our attention to is what sort of sensory information is actually going to be encoded by the otolith organs and how is that actually performed? How are they going to give us this sensory information? So I've written down here the answers to what sort of sensory information is actually going to be encoded uh, by the saccular macula and the utricular macula, and it is our static head tilt. Now what do I mean by that? I mean the orientation of our head within three-dimensional space. So if you tilt your head to one angle, and I'll draw a very extreme little picture of this. Okay, so here's a man with his head uh, on the normal angle, but what if instead he tilts his head at this sort of angle? He, even if he closes his eyes, will be aware that his head is tilted at that angle. And one of the ways by which he will be aware that his head is tilted at that angle is uh, through the sensory information that is being encoded by the saccular macula and the utricular macula. So static head tilt is going to be encoded uh, by the maculae of the otolith organs. And in fact, um, this is all about gravity. This is all about the angle of our head with respect to gravity. And these otolith organs are going to be responsible for us being able to tell when we are on one of those fairground contraptions and we are sitting upside down. So that original motivating example that we wanted to understand, it's going to be um, because of the saccule and the utricle. Okay, the other key piece of sensor information that is going to be encoded by the maculae of the saccule and the utricle is information about linear motion. So this is all about moving in straight lines. So walking forwards is an example, walking sideways is another example, and also linear motion up and down. So if you're in an elevator, accelerating upwards or accelerating downwards, or indeed if you're just getting up from the standing position, then your head will be moving up and down. So information about linear motion in all three of the axes will also be encoded by the maculae of the saccule and the utricle. So, what we now want to understand is how is this actually going to be achieved? How are these sensory organs going to encode information about these things uh, into some sort of electrical signals that can be taken to the brain and interpreted by the brain. Okay, what well comes down to these hair cells fundamentally, the hair cells are the really important um, things that we need to be studying here. So I've drawn out another picture of one of these hair cells, of one of these maculae of our otolith organs. And what I want to firstly discuss is the fact that the hair cells are going to have an innovation. They're going to be innovated by sensory neurons that are going to uh, send their axons into the uh, vestibular nerve and are going to transmit information to the brain. So here then is our hair cell, and now the first thing that I want to draw on here is a sensory nerve that's going to be innovating this hair cell, like so. So here is the terminal of this sensory nerve that is synapsing uh, with the hair cell here, and then it will have a process like so, and this process will go into one of the vestibular nerves. So if it's a hair cell of the utricle um, macula, then of course the uh, process here will be going into the superior vestibular nerve. Uh, 
Whereas if this is a hair cell in the ma uh, saccular macula, then the process will be going into the inferior vestibular nerve in the way that we've discussed. Now these sensory nerves that innovate these hair cells of the vestibular system they are going to be bipolar nerves, and I just want to explain what is meant by a bipolar nerve. So a bipolar nerve is one where you have um, two main processes coming off the cell body. So a bipolar neuron. So here is the cell body here, with the nucleus at the centre, and we're going to have two major processes coming off, like so, if this is going to be a bipolar neuron. And one of these processes will be the process that innovates the hair cell. So we'll call that the peripheral process. So here is the peripheral process of this bipolar neuron. And this will end with this terminal here that will be synapsing with the hair cell. And then we've got another process coming off in the opposite direction. And this is what we'll call the central process of the bipolar neuron, and this is the one that's going to go onwards to the central nervous system and deliver the information to the brain. So, coming back to this picture here, if we're talking, for instance, about the saccular macula, then the peripheral process of the bipolar neuron will be innovating one of the uh, hair cells in the saccular macula here, and then the cell body of that bipolar neuron will then be in the inferior scarpa's ganglion, and the peripheral process will run in this inferior vestibular nerve here. Then the central process will run in the inferior vestibular nerve in the opposite direction. It'll fuse, of course, with the superior vestibular nerve, and therefore the central process will go into the full vestibular nerve. Then it will go into the full vestibular cochlear nerve, and then it will end up in the brain, and we'll talk later about um, what uh, happens in the brain and where the information is going to go in the brain. Okay, so we now understand then that these hair cells of the um, oscillative organs maculae are going to be innervated by these bipolar neurons that are going to have their cell bodies in one of the scarpa ganglia uh, and are going to send their central processes into the brain. Okay, so what we need to discuss then is how often is this bipolar neuron here actually going to fire action potentials? What is actually going to be triggering it to fire action potentials? Well, the thing that triggers this bipolar neuron here, which I'll colour in, in pink, to fire action potentials is the neurotransmitter glutamate. So the hair cell here can release the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate. And it is still a little bit controversial whether uh, this excitatory neurotransmitter released by the hair cells is glutamate, but generally it's widely agreed that it probably is glutamate. So, the hair cells that are innervated by these bipolar neurons, they can release an excitatory neurotransmitter, which is most likely glutamate, and glutamate will open uh, ionotropic ion channels here and trigger um, excitatory currents to enter the inside of the cell and depolarize the neuron uh, to fire action potentials. So the rate at which this neuron will fire action potentials is determined by how much glutamate the hair cells are releasing onto uh, their these peripheral processes of these bipolar neurons. So the big question now becomes what determines how much glutamate then that these uh, hair cells are releasing? Well, the amount of glutamate that they release is determined by what the electrical potential difference across their cell membrane is doing. And the electrical potential difference across their cell membrane is determined by how um, bent the cilia, the stereocilia and the kinocilia are on the apical surface. So let me explain this in a little bit more detail. So these cilia, these finger-like projections on the top of the uh, hair cells, they are connected by protein fibres between their tips, which I'm drawing on here. And I'll just colour these structures in, in blue. So there are protein fibres linking the tips of the finger-like projections, the stereocilia and the kinocilium. Uh, here on the apical surface of this hair cell, and these structures are known as tip links. Now, when the tip links become stretched, 
By mechanisms that are not completely understood, it seems to result in the opening of ion channels that allow uh, cations to enter the cytoplasm of the cell. So let me explain this in more detail. If the hair cells are bent in this direction here, i.e. towards the kinocilium, so if you can imagine all of the uh, stereocilium moving in the direction towards the kinocilium, so imagine the kinocilium going this way, and imagine all the stereocilia going in this direction as well, and what might actually cause them to bend? Well, potentially the movement of the otoconia, of the otolithic membrane, which these uh, finger-like projections are all implanted in, might actually lead to them uh, bending in this way, and we'll come back to that in a moment. So if all of the cilia were to bend in this direction, what would actually happen to the tip links? Well, hopefully you can appreciate that the tip links would actually be stretched because the tips of the uh, cilia would become further away if every single one of them moved in this direction. If you're struggling to see that, then maybe it would be helpful to imagine what would happen if you went in the opposite direction. So if you bent everything in the opposite direction, you bent the kinocilium in this direction, you bent all the stereocilia in this direction as well, then maybe it's easier for you to see that if you bent everything in the opposite direction, the tip links would become less stretched because there would be less distance between the tips of the stereocilia and the kinocilia. Okay, so um, if you uh, bend in the opposite direction, the opposite will then happen. So, bend in one direction, bend in the direction towards the kinocilium, and you stretch the tip links, and this will result in the opening of cation channels, okay? And these cation channels have a long title, they're called mechanosensitive, because they are sensitive to mechanical force. So, mechanosensitive cation channels. Whereas, if you bend in the opposite direction, i.e. away from the kinocilium, then the tip links will become less stretched and that will result in mechanosensitive cation channels closing that were previously open. So it's a gradient basically. Depending on how stretched the um, cilia are in either direction, this will determine uh, how many mechanosensitive cation channels are actually open and that will determine what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that the orientation of the stereocilia and the kinocilium on the apical membrane of the hair cell here completely and utterly correlates with what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is going to be doing. So, let me explain this in more detail now. So when we bend in this direction towards the kinocilium, I said that the tip links will stretch and this through mechanisms that are still not completely understood leads to the opening of these special cation channels that are mechanosensitive cation channels. Now when you open these, the major cation that is going to now move through them is potassium ions and they're going to move from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. Now that's a very odd movement for potassium because usually when you open a potassium permeable channel uh, in a cell membrane, it usually results in the movement of potassium out of the cell because potassium is usually at a far higher level inside the cytoplasm of the cell than it is outside the cell. However, remember, in the endolymph that is inside the vestibular ducts, you have a very high concentration of potassium and therefore when you actually open these cation channels here potassium is actually going to move into the cytoplasm of the cell rather than out of the cytoplasm of the cell so that's only because of that odd uh, consistency of the um, endolymph that is inside these vestibular ducts so potassium will move into the cytoplasm of the cell and of course what that will do is it will depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. So the more the um, hairs then are stretched in the direction towards the kinocilium, bent in the direction towards the kinocilium, the more depolarized the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. In contrast, the more bent the hairs are in the opposite direction, i.e. away from the kinocilium, then the more um, 
hyperpolarised the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane will be. OK, so it's a lovely spectrum. The um, state of the hairs on the apical surface of the hair cells correlates beautifully with what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the hair cell will be doing. And then the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of the hair cell correlates to how frequently the bipolar neuron will be firing because it's going to correlate to how much glutamate we're releasing. So let me complete the story by telling you how uh, the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane will determine how much glutamate we're re releasing. Well this is a very simple story. So down at the basal portion of the hair cell of course you're going to have vesicles which will be filled with glutamate neurotransmitter or if it's some other excitatory neurotransmitter uh, that excitatory neurotransmitter so here is the glutamate neurotransmitter inside these vesicles shown as these orange blobs so what then triggers the release the exocytosis of these vesicles containing the glutamate neurotransmitter well of course it is calcium signals okay always, nearly always in biology, the trigger for exocytosis is calcium. So, how can we get a change in the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane to correlate to a calcium signal? Well, we can use voltage-gated calcium channels, which is what this is supposed to be here. So this is a VGCC for short, which stands for a voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, so what will happen then is depending on the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane that will determine the fraction of voltage gated calcium channels down here at the basal portion of the cell membrane which are actually in the open state so the more depolarized the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is the more voltage gated calcium channels will be open the more hyperpolarized it is the fewer voltage gated calcium channels will be open so this will determine how much calcium you're getting coming into the cytoplasm of the cell and that will determine how much glutamate you are releasing so i hope that this is now starting to become clear the hair cells are innervated by these primary bipolar neurons which have their cell bodies in the scarpa ganglia and the mechanical positions of the hairs on the apical surface of the hair cells, i.e. how bent they are towards the kinocilium or in the opposite direction, is going to determine what the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane is, and it's a spectrum. So the more bent you are towards the kinocilium, the more depolarized you are, the more bent away from the kinocilium are, you are, the more hyperpolarized you are. Okay. Uh, the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane will then determine the fraction of voltage-gated calcium channels that are open and therefore how much calcium is coming into the cytoplasm of the cell and therefore uh, how many synaptic vesicles containing glutamate we are releasing and the amount of glutamate we're releasing onto these bipolar neuron set peripheral processes will determine how frequently they fire action potentials. So what we have overall done here is we have translated a mechanical piece of information, i.e. the orientation of these um, hairs, into an electrical piece of information, i.e. how frequently action potentials are firing in this bipolar neuron here. Okay, so now to explain then how we can actually use this to encode information about static head tilt. So let's start off with the case that you have your head in the normal position. So let's say we have a little man standing up like so. Okay, now, remember there is gravity. Gravity is pulling everything down towards the ground. So here is the ground. Gravity is pulling things down towards the ground. Now, the otoconia, these crystals of calcium carbonate, they are not immune to gravity. They will feel the pull of gravity. And this is going to determine how much well, it's going to determine the uh, position of the otolithic membrane. So, let's start off with the saccule, because that one's going to be more interesting in this case. So remember the saccule, the macula of the saccule is in this vertical position, like so. Can you imagine that what's going to happen is the otolithic membrane that sits on top of this 
um, sakida makida here, when you are standing in the vertical position, it's going to be feeling a pull downwards. The otoconia will be pulling downwards, and that will mean that the hairs will be moved in this downward direction. Okay. Now, if you think about some of the hair cells down here, maybe, that are oriented with their kinocilium sort of facing upwards and their stereocilia facing downwards, that's going to mean that their kinocilium will be dragged towards their stereocilia. It will be dragged in the opposite direction compared to activation. Oh, sorry, no. Th let me correct that. Remember, uh, the kinocilium is oriented away from the striota in this case, so the kinocilium will actually be towards the bottom here, and the stereocilia will be towards the top. So actually, when we're in the vertical position, the um, otolithic membrane will be moving downwards, and that will be dragging the kinocilium downwards and all the stereocilia downwards, and that will be moving the stereocilia towards the kinocilia in these hair cells down here and therefore they're going to start firing action potentials, uh, well, their bipolar neurons that innovate them are going to start firing action potentials more rapidly. Okay, so activation, oh, well, rapid firing of the bipolar neurons innovating this portion of the saccular macula is going to indicate to us that we are standing up. It's more difficult to imagine what would happen uh, with the utricular macula here, because remember the utricular macula is roughly horizontal, it's on the inferior floor of the utricle, so when you're in this standing position, the otolithic membrane won't be moving at all really. Okay. Now, let's imagine putting our head on a tilt, so if I now do something quite extreme here. Let's have our head tilted to the right in this way. So we are looking at this man from the front here. So we're now tilting his head to the right in this way. What will happen then is the otolithic membrane of both the utricle and the macula will start to move. And I'll do it for the utricular macula because that's one's going to be more impressive than the saccular macula. So if you imagine what would happen now if he's got his head on this tilt to the right, um, now the utricular macula is no longer going to be in a horizontal plane, now it's going to be tilted um, on an angle. So if we're thinking about the right uh, labyrinth utricular macula, and of course you have to remember that the same thing will be happening on the other side as well, but we'll just do this on one side to keep things simple. So. If we're imagining the right utricular macula, what will now happen is this lateral portion will be lower down than this medial portion, and that means that the otolithic membrane will move in this direction. So what's that actually going to do? Well, let's think about the hair cells on this side of the striola. So on this side of the striola, their kinocilia are oriented towards the striola, and therefore their kinocilia are on this side, and their the lower down stereocilia are on this side. So when we move the otolithic membrane in this direction, as we will when we tilt our head to the right, that's going to bend the kinocilia towards the stereocilia. So you'd expect the hair cells here to release less glutamate, they will hyperpolarize, they'll release less glutamate, and their bipolar neurons will fire less frequently. Whereas uh, the hair cells over here, their kinocilia are oriented in this direction, so you've got the kinocilia over here and the smaller stereocilia on this side, and therefore when we tilt everything like that, the otolithic membrane will move like that, it will drag the stereocilia towards the kinocilia in the case of these hair cells here, they will depolarize, release more glutamate, and therefore their bipolar neurons will fire action potentials more rapidly. So what I hope I've shown you by these two examples, given you a sense of with these two examples, is the fact that with different head tilts, so you can continue going through more examples for yourself, imagine going through different head tilts, what I hope you can appreciate is that with your head tilted in different ways, you're going to have activation of different regions of the maculae, of the utricle and the saccule. So different head tilts will produce different patterns of activation of the hair cells of the saccular and utricular maculae, okay? And therefore that will result in different patterns of 
action potentials coming from all the bipolar neurons that innervate all these hair cells. So all of the hair cells of both of these maculae, they are all innervated by bipolar neurons. And by looking at the pattern of action potentials that are coming from all of these bipolar neurons from all of these hair cells, we can work out head tilt is the idea. The brain can work out head tilt from the pattern of activation of those bipolar neurons. Now, remember, it's not just going to be the case that with certain head tilts you get some uh, bipolar neurons activated and firing very rapidly. Some of them will actually start firing less rapidly. So for instance, going back to this example of where we've tilted our head to the right, the bipolar neurons innervating the hair cells on this lateral aspect of this right utricular macula they are actually going to be firing action potentials less frequently now than they were when we had our head in the normal position like so because they've now had their, uh, their hairs on the apical surface bent in the opposite direction where the kinocilia are moving towards the stereocilia and that will result in less glutamate being released than at the resting level and therefore uh, the bipolar neurons innervating them will fire action potentials at an even lower rate. So the pattern of activation of all of the bipolar neurons, the frequency at which they're firing action potentials, we can interpret all of that information to give us an understanding of what our current static head tilt is, the position or orientation of our head with respect to gravity. So gravity is very important here because gravity is determining how the otolithic membrane is oriented and that's determining the uh, bending of the hairs on these hair cells all over the maculae and therefore the pattern of activation. So by looking at all of the bipolar neurons coming from all of these hair cells of the otolithic organs uh, maculae and how frequently they're firing action potentials, we can work out head tilt is the idea. Okay, so that's the way that we encode information about the position of our head and it will be sent to the brain. I realize that it is a complicated thing to interpret. Um, the brain has a difficult job to interpret all that information and work out what's the position of my head in space, but I hope you understand that in principle you could, from that information of how frequently you're getting action potentials from all these different bipolar neurons, in principle you could use that to work out what the current head tilt is. Now, here's the little caveat to that, which is that the otolithic organs um, maculae, they also are involved in sensing the linear motion, and actually it's very difficult to determine the difference between linear motion and static head tilt just with the information from uh, the otolith organs and in fact other information is going to be needed to tell the difference for instance information coming from the muscles of the body and also from the motor system which might have commanded muscles to move okay right uh, so let me um, explain this to you so let's now have an example of linear motion so let's have our little man here, and let's say this time he's not going to tilt his head, so he's going to keep his head in the normal position, and this time he's going to move in this direction, so he's going to start sidestepping, or we can imagine that he's on some sort of uh, moving object. Uh, uh, let's make it a skateboard, so he's on a skateboard, which is going this way, okay? So he's moving in a linear direction in this horizontal direction. Okay, so or, or sideways direction. So let's think, how are the um, maculae actually going to be able to encode this information? Well, you have to understand that when you move in this way, particularly when you accelerate linearly, what's going to initially happen is the otoconia, because of their inertia, they will move in the opposite direction relative to the rest of your body. So let's imagine, um, let's say, the utricle macula on the right hand side again. So here is our utricular macula on the right hand side. We know that we have the otolithic membrane on top with the otoconia in. Now we're saying we're going to be moving in this direction. We're moving in the left direction. That way is left with regards to this picture. So we move in this direction. What will happen then is the macula will move in this direction. 
Now, because of the inertia of those otoconia of the otolithic membrane, they will move in the opposite direction relative to the macula. So they don't want to move. Remember, uh, Newton's first law is everything doesn't really want to move. Everything, or sorry, everything, Newton's first law isn't that everything doesn't want to move. Newton's first law is that everything will remain moving at the same speed and in the same direction, i.e. at the same velocity, forever, unless acted upon by a force. So the otoconia wants to they don't want to start moving in this direction unless they're absolutely forced to, okay? Um, they want to continue um, moving in the same way that they had previously. So we are now imagining that we've just got on this skateboard and we are accelerating to the left here. What will initially happen is the otoconia will almost be left behind, they'll be dragging behind, and the otolithic membrane relative to the uh, macula, which is attached to the rest of the body and therefore has to move in this direction with the same acceleration as the rest of the body. Relative to that, the otolithic membrane will move to the right, okay? And hopefully you can appreciate that that movement to the right is exactly what I've just described for the movement to the right that you'd get if you tilted your head to the right. So the otolithic membrane is now going to move to the right and that's going to produce the exact same pattern of activation and inactivation of bipolar neurons as we had previously when we were tilting our head to the right, i.e. Uh, you will excite these hair cells here because their kinocilia are oriented in this direction and therefore you'll bend their stereocilia towards the kinocilia and depolarize their membranes, increase their glutamate release and therefore their bipolar neurons innervating them will fire action potentials more rapidly. Meanwhile, with these ones over here, you will bend their kinocilia towards their stereocilia, and therefore you'll hyperpolarize them, reduce their glutamate release, and reduce the frequency at which their bipolar neurons are firing action potentials. So you'll get the exact same pattern of activation and inactivation that you did for tilting your head to the right. So as far as the information coming from the vestibular system is concerned, you can't distinguish the difference between moving to the left, accelerating to the left, and tilting your head to the right. And you can come up with other examples for that. So equivalently, if you tilted your head to the left, that's equivalent to moving to the right. Or if you tilted your head forwards, that's equivalent to moving backwards as far as the vestibular system is concerned. Okay, it cannot tell the difference. So more information will be needed by the brain to understand whether the head is merely on a tilt or whether we are moving. So what sort of information could the brain also receive? Well, for instance, information from the muscles in the neck, which can tell you about the position of the neck, would be very useful to determine whether it's a head tilt or whether you're moving. Also, visual information would obviously uh, tell you if you are moving. But even if you're, um, you've got your eyes shut, you can still tell the difference between you moving horizontally and your head just being on a tilt. So. Um, visual information isn't essential for being able to distinguish these two, but as far as the vestibular system is concerned, it can't tell the difference between those two. So, those are the things then that the uh, maculae of the otolith organs are responsible for sensing static head tilt and linear motion, and as far as the vestibular system is concerned, the information that the vestibular system is going to be sending to the brain is not enough to actually distinguish between these two. Okay, so I'll just summarise again what we have seen here. We have these maculae uh, within the saccules on both sides of our head and the utricles on both sides of our head. And these regions, these contain these hair cells oriented in these fancy ways uh, towards and away from these lines known as the striola down the middle of the maculae. And the orientation of our head with respect to gravity and also the movement of our head, the linear acceleration of our head, can result in the movement of the otolithic membrane and therefore changes in the activation and inactivation pattern of the different hair cells of these maculae. That will be translated into differences in the action potential firing rate of the bipolar neurons that innervate all of these uh, hair cells and that electrical information that will be arriving at the brain from all of those different bipolar neurons, the information of how fast 
how frequently they are firing action potentials, that can now be interpreted by the brain to work out um, the static head tilt of the um, head with respect to gravity or the linear motion of the head. Okay, but as I say, you can't distinguish between those two just from that information, and you'll need other proprioceptive information, such as, in particular, information coming from the muscles in the neck, which can tell you about whether your head really is at a tilt, or whether this is just linear motion. Okay, so, we'll have a break here. That concludes our discussion uh, of how the otolith organs work for at least a while. Uh, then what we're going to do in the next video is we'll go on to the semicircular ducts. We'll have a look at what they are going to detect.